Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to America's tribute to the men and women of its armed forces, to the men and women of Desert Shield and Desert Storm. This is a proud day for our country and for all who wear its uniform. It is an especially proud day for the sons and daughters, the mothers and fathers, husbands and wives of all those who serve. The long days of conflict and uncertainty that began more than 10 months ago are over. And now it is time to celebrate, to honor those who have sacrificed, those who have endured for their country, both at home and overseas. And we honor them not only for what they have done, but for what they continue to do, to preserve, protect, defend. And all are honored, not just one individual or one unit or one command or even one service. Instead, we honor collectively all of America's armed forces, past and present, and those elements within it, the active guard and reserve, that combine to make it the best in the world. As a nation, as an extended family, we have all watched in wonder and admiration as they did those things that no military force has ever done, that no other military can do. A combined force, determined, dedicated, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard, land, sea, and air, all part of one team, all united in one effort, determined to win. And when the word came to execute, they were ready. It began at 2100 hours, 16 January, 1991, in the skies over Baghdad. A black, dart-like shape moved swiftly through the Arabian night, undetected and unseen, to deliver a message from America, a message that said, that victory could not, that victory would not be denied. Ladies and gentlemen, the F-117 Stealth Fighter. The sound of rotors in the sky has been a familiar one to GIs on the ground ever since the waning days of World War II. And during the last 45 years, those helicopters have evolved in one to our most versatile and flexible weapon systems. They're designed to do almost everything, from search and rescue to medical evacuation, from hauling cargo to reconnaissance, special operations to ground attack. And during Operation Desert Storm, Army, Navy, Marine, and Air Force choppers played a vital role in ensuring ultimate victory. The first to pass in review today, a flight of 10 Army choppers from Fort Stewart's Hunter Army Airfield. The same aircraft, the same air crews that took the war to the enemy in the Gulf. They supported the 24th Infantry Division's historic thrust into Iraqi territory, an offensive that won the day for the 18th Airborne Corps in the Euphrates Valley, one that helped end the war quickly, decisively. During that operation, Army helicopters flew round the clock in combat, keeping the Iraqi Republican Guard hunkered down in its bunkers. They resupplied the fast-moving 24th with critical supplies, served as eyes and ears of the ground troops, finding the enemy and cutting him off, preventing his escape. And today, flying side by side with the Victory Division choppers as they pass in review, the famed Huey Medical Evacuation Helos, the airborne lifesavers so familiar to those who served in Southeast Asia.
Helicopters were also an important element in Gulf naval operations as well, supporting both Navy air and surface forces. Today we see Navy choppers that help make the difference in the Middle East. Minesweepers, big lift helos, helicopters so powerful they can carry a mean marine light armored vehicle. We'll see helicopters designed to haul troops and cargo, search and rescue choppers as well. Versatile aircraft that can find down flyers, pluck them from the ocean or deep behind enemy lines. Also Navy choppers used for highly specialized missions. Some packed with sophisticated electronic gear designed to detect, track, and destroy enemy submarines. They were always part of the Navy team whenever the fleet steamed in harm's way. And wherever you found a member of the United States Marine Corps in the Gulf, you could always count on a Marine helicopter being nearby. Marine choppers were there to carry the troops and their gear into battle. They kept them resupplied and re-equipped. They ferried the injured and wounded back to aid stations and hospitals. They helped monitor and control the battle on the ground. And they directly supported that battle, laying down suppressive fire, attacking enemy armor, escorting Marine troop-carrying choppers into the fight, and performing armed reconnaissance even when poor weather severely limited visibility. Some Marine helos equipped for in-flight refueling, so when trouble broke out in Somalia, they could fly non-stop to evacuate civilians, then return to the fight. Just Some helicopter missions were carried out under the cover of darkness when speed and stealth were needed to get the job done. The aircraft frequently assigned these dangerous missions were choppers from the Air Force's Special Operations Command. With their ability to see in the dark and the intense training given their crews, these helicopters were able to move friendly forces deep behind enemy lines without being detected and then bring them back out again safely. Pave Low and Blackhawks were the aircraft of choice for these special missions. And as they fly by, you'll note how well matched to the mission they appear. These big choppers were among the first Allied aircraft to penetrate Iraqi airspace. Another the first to complete a successful combat rescue of U.S. airmen since the Vietnam War. Ladies and gentlemen, General H. Norman Schwarzkopf, Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Central Forces, and the members of the U.S. Central Command, headquartered at McDill Air Force Base, adjacent to Tampa, Florida. Central Command is the headquarters for U.S. military affairs in 18 countries in the Mideast, Southwest Asia, and Northwest Africa. And the friendly bears made lots of friends, not just here, but all over the world. A great American ambassador, a great American. We love you. We love you, General. Ladies and gentlemen, we now present the Central Command Troops under the direction of Colonel Patrick J. Neiman, U.S. Army. This marching element consists of members of all the armed services assigned to the United States Central Command. Operation Desert Shield began August the 7th, 1990, with the order to deploy U.S. military forces to Saudi Arabia. Three days later, heavy ground forces began boarding ships for the voyage to the Middle East. And in less than one month, 100,000 American troops were in the region. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Special Operations Command, Central Command, under the direction of Colonel Jesse L. Johnson, U.S. Army. Special Operations troops and units from all the armed forces who participated in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm.
Special Operations Forces deployed to the Persian Gulf beginning on August the 7th in 1990, and their mission was to conduct special operations on land, in the air, and on the sea in support of CENTCOM's military objectives. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a coalition of flags, all the coalition countries that participated in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. They represent Argentina, Greece, Qatar, Australia, Italy, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Senegal, Bangladesh, Morocco, Spain, Belgium, Netherlands, Syria, Canada, Niger, Turkey, Denmark, Norway, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Oman, the United Kingdom, France, Pakistan, and the United States. Seven countries sent medical units only. They are China, New Zealand, Singapore, Czechoslovakia, Poland, South Korea, and Hungary. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General John J. Yosak and the 3rd United States Army and at Fort McPherson, Georgia. These are United States Army Forces Central Command. This Army organization known as Arsent was the senior Army headquarters in Southwest Asia. It was the largest single component in the Gulf War. At the peak of the operation, General Yosak commanded 303,000 soldiers, plus 30,000 British and French ground forces. Now approaching the review stand, the United States Army Band under the direction of Colonel L. Brian Shelbourne, Jr. The Army's senior musical organization, the United States Army Band, represents the entire United States Army. This band is known as Pershing's Own because it was formed in 1922 by personal order of General of the Army's John J. Blackjack Pershing, who had commanded all of U.S. ground forces in Europe in World War I. And this band will lead the parade in New York again on Monday. Ladies and gentlemen, the 7th Corps, United States Army, directed under the leadership of Lieutenant General Frederick M. Franks, Jr. The 7th Corps, including its combat division, regiments, and brigades, and all its combat support and combat service support units. 7th Corps, based in Germany, began supporting Operation Desert Shield in November of 1990. General Thomas G. Rain and the 1st Mechanized Infantry Driven Division, United States Army. The 1st Mech Division based in Fort Riley, Kansas, and the 2nd Armored Division forward based near Gulfstead, Germany. They began supporting Desert Shield in December of 1990, and in Desert Storm, this unit led 7th Corps right flank attacks against Iraqi forces. 12,000 soldiers deployed from the 1st Infantry to Saudi Arabia, where they were joined by 5,000 forces the second armed division. Approaching next is Major General Ronald H. Griffith and the 1st Armored Division and elements of the 3rd Infantry Division, both based in Germany. The 1st Armored Division began supporting Operation Desert Shield in December 1990. Including other U.S. Army units assigned to it for operational control, the division had 17,000 soldiers under its command when it took part in 7th Corps sweeps around the left flank of Iraqi positions in Iraq.
gentlemen, Major General Jerry R. Rutherford and the 3rd Armored Division and elements of the 8th Infantry Division, both based in Germany. This division began supporting Desert Shield in December of 1990, and its mission in Desert Storm was to support 7th Corps advance around the left end of the Iraqi positions, and as we all know by now, they did a darn good job. Approximately 17,000 soldiers deployed from the 3rd Armored and 8th Infantry Divisions to the Persian Gulf. And they destroyed more than four Iraqi divisions. And ladies and gentlemen, here's some of the equipment that the Army used in the defeat of Iraqi forces in Kuwait. This is the M1A1 tank, known as the Abrams, and the M2 Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle. The Abrams huh? tank is named after General Creighton W. Abrams. It sure didn't. Former Army oh, Chief of Staff down the road. That's who the, commanded the that's tank the battalion under General George S. Patton, Jr. Right, back then. in World War II. All right. This first piece of equipment is the M2 Bradley. There were 2,200 Bradleys deployed to Saudi Arabia. The Bradley is equipped with a 25-millimeter automatic stabilized cannon, anti-tank missiles, a 7.62-millimeter machine gun. There were six firing ports around the vehicle, which enabled infantrymen inside to fire their weapons while under armor cover. Ladies and gentlemen, the M2 Bradley has a 600 horsepower diesel engine, and the Bradley contain, uh, can attain a top speed of about 40 miles per hour. And now coming into view of the reviewing stand, this is the M1A1 Abrams tank. Combat loaded, this tank weighs 67 tons with a top speed of more than 40 miles an hour. The tank has a 120 million millimeter smoothbore cannon, fires a thin stabilized anti-tank round with a 1500 horsepower turbine engine.
Gentlemen, under the direction of Major General John H. Tulele, Jr., this is the 1st Cavalry Division of Fort Hood, Texas. 1st Cavalry Division began supporting Operation Desert Shield in September of 1990. In Desert Storm, the division initially supported 18th Airborne Corps, then the 7th Corps. The division had 17,000 soldiers under its control. And they are beautiful. General Gary E. Luck, Commanding General of the 18th Airborne Corps and the 18th Airborne Corps of the United States Army, based at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Soldiers of the 18th Airborne Corps began deploying to Saudi Arabia on August the 7th, 1990, and the Corps was selected because of its unique ability to rapidly deploy a highly versatile, powerful combined arms force. Major General Barry R. McCaffrey and the 24th Mechanized Infantry Division, the United States Army. All soldiers of the 24th Mechanized Infantry Division are based at Fort Stewart, Georgia. The 24th Infantry Division was placed on alert on August 7, 1990, as the first ship carrying division equipment and soldiers departed from Savannah, Georgia on August 20th, 1990. The division was joined in Saudi Arabia by the 197th Mechanized Infantry Southwest Asia, the division's total combined arms team included 25,000 soldiers in 34 battalions. The 24th Mech. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the multiple launch rocket system known as the MLRS. It's a free flight artillery rocket system used primarily to attack enemy artillery systems, air defense systems, and large targets, otherwise unsuitable for attack by cannon artillery. And each launcher vehicle has a crew of three. The launcher carries 12 rockets, each with 644 individual bomblets, which disperse from the warhead about 200 meters above the target all 12 rockets can be fired in less than one minute. A single MLRS battalion has 27 launchers. Uh, because massed MLRS fires were so effective in the Gulf War, Iraqi soldiers referred to the MLRS as steel pain.
This is the M109A3 self-propelled howitzer. It's the Army's medium artillery system for heavy divisions. The howitzer fires a 95-pound projectile, almost 15 miles. And types of projectiles include high explosive, bomblet, illumination, and smoke. When combat loaded, the howitzer weighs 56,000 pounds and has a crew of nine. In an armored division, there are three battalions of self-propelled howitzers, each battalion having 24 of the weapons. Ladies and gentlemen, from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Major General Henry H. Shelton and the 82nd Airborne. <laughs> Troopers of the 82nd Airborne Division were the first ground forces deployed to Saudi Arabia. They began the deployment only five days after Iraq invaded Kuwait. Division initial mission was to secure the international airport at Dahran and secure the port a jubail for the arrival of additional forces, and that they indeed did. The 82nd Airborne Division is the only airborne division in America's armed forces. Nicknamed America's Guard of Honor, the division remains ready to begin combat deployment to any spot on Earth within 18 hours of being told to do so. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, Major General J.H. Binford P. III and the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault. The Screaming Eagles. This division, nicknamed the Screaming Eagles, had two separate missions during its deployment to the Persian Gulf. First mission was to provide a covering force along the Kuwaiti border as part of the force defending Saudi Arabia. The second was to conduct an attack deep into Iraq to destroy Iraqi forces and cut off lines of communications with Baghdad. Both missions were fantastically accomplished. By the end of the war, the 101st Airborne Division was the northernmost army unit in the west and in the east. The Screaming Eagles moved farther, faster, and controlled more terrain than any unit in military history. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Chief Warrant Officer W. Brian Grills and the 101st Airborne Division Band, based at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. Lieutenant Colonel Andrew R. Birdie and the 101st Airborne Division Troops. Members of the 2nd Battalion, 187th Infantry Regiment. This battalion deployed to Saudi Arabia on September 12, 1990, and the battalion's mission during Operation Desert Storm was to block a crucial highway in Iraq and to prevent Iraqi reinforcements from using that highway. And you can bet it was successful. Colonel James Darling, commander of the 196th Field Artillery Brigade, headquartered in Tennessee, and the Army National Guard.
More than 62,000 Army Guardsmen were mobilized under federal control during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And of these, almost 38,000 deployed to Southwest Asia. The flags of the 50 states and U.S. territories and the Army National Guard soldiers behind them represent all the soldiers of the Army National Guard who served during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And many Army National Guardsmen are still in the Persian Gulf, upholding a 353-year-long tradition of service in every conflict in our nation's history. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Colonel Roscoe C. Young, Jr., who commanded the 115th Mobile Army Surgical Hospital in the Persian Gulf, and this represents the members of the National Guard of the District of Columbia. <laughs> this marching element is comprised of members of the 547th Transportation Company, 115th Mobile Army Surgical Hospital and the 372nd Military Police Battalion. We are so proud these are our hometown troops and these units served in Saudi Arabia and Iraq during the war. The 547th Transportation Company logged more than 700,000 miles on the road and sustained no casualties. Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Howard T. Mooney, commander of the 352nd Civil Affairs Command, Riverdale, Maryland. This is the 1st United States Army. <laughs> Headquartered at Fort George Meade in Maryland. These are our good local folks, too, and they're members of the 1st Army. were placed on alert in August of 90, and unit activations and deployments were continuing when hostilities ended. They started out and they finished it up. One unit of the 1st Army, the 14th Quartermaster Detachment, suffered more combat casualties than any other single U.S. unit when its barracks were struck by a Scud missile. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Miller Love, commanding officer of the 360th Civil Affairs Brigade of Columbia, South Carolina, representing the United States Army Reserve from the 2nd Army Region of 8 Southeastern States, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. They're headquartered in Fort Gillum, Georgia, the 2nd United States Army. More than 45,000 2nd Army soldiers from the 341 units were mobilized. 289 of these units deployed to Southwest Asia. And we haven't forgotten that uh, nearly 100 of these units are still on duty in the Persian Gulf area.
Ladies and gentlemen, Major General Terrence D. Mulcahy and the 4th United States Army. They're headquartered at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. It supervises the readiness and training of 144,000 reservists and National Guardsmen in a seven-state Midwestern area. Units contributing soldiers to this formation are 416th Engineer Command, which built more than 2,000 miles of road and constructed 290 miles of pipeline. 300th Military Police Command, which operated POW camps and performed other security functions. The 83rd, 123rd, 86th, and 88th Army Reserve all provided critical support in transportation and services. And the important thing, the 425th Transportation Brigade, which performed long-haul transportation of fuel, water, ammunition, and other supplies, all needed to keep the war going. Ladies and gentlemen, under the direction of Chief Warrant Officer David A. Ratliff, this is the first United States Army Band based at Fort George Meade, Maryland. Formed during the Civil War, he participated in the Civil War, the Indian Wars, the Philippine Insurrection, and in World War I. During World War I, the band fought alongside the 1st Infantry Division. leadership of Lieutenant Colonel Gene Johnson from Fort Sam Houston, Texas. This is the 5th United States Army. This marching unit represents more than 12,000 reservists from the 5th Army area called to active duty for operations in Southwest Asia. They are from Arkansas, Louisiana, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas. Fifth Army troops provided maintenance and medical care, postal operations, military police, and security forces for prisoners of war camps. Even today, members of the Fifth Army are participating in operations providing comfort in support of U.S. efforts to aid the Kurdish refugees in Turkey and northern Iraq. Colonel James C. Martin, commander of the 159th Support Group, a reserve unit based in Helena, Montana. This is the 6th United States Army, headquartered at Presidio, San Francisco, California. The 6th Army began mobilizing troops in support of Operation Desert Shield on August 24, 1990. And during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, the 6th Army mobilized 120 combat support and combat service support units providing transportation, supply, and medical services.
Ladies and gentlemen, these vehicles are known as heavy expanded mobility tactical trucks, the Hemet. The Hemet has a 445 horsepower diesel engine and can travel up to 55 miles per hour. It can climb a 60% slope fully loaded. All eight wheels are powered and it can ford a stream four feet deep. They tell me a total of 12,206 of these Hemets have been purchased. And uh, they were used, of course, in the desert campaign. And they were so critical that they were flown directly from the manufacturer to Saudi Arabia. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the Patriot Missile. Twenty-seven Patriot missile batteries were deployed to the Middle East, including four batteries to Israel, two to Turkey. Out of 53 possible targets in their engagement area, Patriot missiles successfully intercepted 51 of them. The Patriot missile, made with pride in the USA. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant General Walter E. Boomer and the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force from Camp Pendleton, California. The 1st Marine Expeditionary Force assumed operational control of all Marine forces in Central Command Theater of Operations on 2nd September, 1990. And in case you didn't know, Desert Storm was the largest operation in the history of the Marine Corps. The main attack came overland while the threat from the sea pinned 80,000 Iraqi troops in useless coastal defensive positions. As their share of the war, the Marines would claim 1,040 enemy tanks, 608 armored personnel carriers, and 432 artillery pieces destroyed or captured, and at least 20,000 prisoners taken. Under the direction of Colonel John R. Bourgeois, ladies and gentlemen, the United States Marine Band. Marine Band is America's oldest musical organization, founded by an act of Congress in 1798. Made its debut in the White House in 1801 for John Adams. It was given the title the President's Own by Mr. Thomas Jefferson. Ladies and gentlemen, Major General James M. Myatt and the 1st Marine Division of Camp Pendleton, California. First Marine Division landed in Saudi Arabia and moved forward and to the west. And on their right flank between the main road leading north and the Persian Gulf was the Joint Forces Command East. Behind the 1st Marine Division is Major General William M. Keyes and the contingent from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, the 2nd Marine Division. (laughs) 
second division on the 27th of February, stayed in the vicinity of algebra, forming the bottom half of the box that caught the retreat of the Iraqi main force along what became known as the Highway of Death. Marine reservists were an integral part of every Marine unit. The total of 35,500 men and women were called up from the reserves. 13,000 of them served in Southwest Asia. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, from El Toro, California, Major General Royal N. Moore, Jr. and the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. By January 16th, one-fourth of all U.S. fixed-wing aircraft in the theater were Marines, and they had a full role to play. Air strikes reduced Iraqi's front-line divisions by 50%, and the second line was lessened to 60%. The air campaign also masked the forward movement of the Allied ground forces. And the Marines are proud to say that their readiness capability remained at more than 90% throughout the war. Ladies and gentlemen, with the baton of Warrant Officer Fuqua, this is the 2nd Marine Division Band. They accompany the 2nd Marine Division units into Southwest Asia. Under the leadership of Brigadier General James A. Brabham, Jr., this is the First Force Service Support Group from Camp Pendleton, California. Perhaps in no other Marine Corps component did reservists play such a large role as they did within the combat service support element. These men and women filled roles in many occupational specialties which were a vital link in the supply system providing food, fuel, and ammunition to forward combatants. Next, Major General Harry W. Jenkins, Jr. and the 4th Marine Expeditionary Brigade from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina.
as known in marine parlance, the 4th MEB sailed from Moorhead City, uh, Carolina, and the brigade numbered 8,000, loaded in five ships. It proved to be the fastest deployment of an amphibious force this size, with the formation and departure completed within 11 days from the execution order. And next, ladies and gentlemen, under the baton of Warrant Officer Harris, this is the 1st Marine Division Band. Ladies and gentlemen, Major General John I. Hopkins and the 7th Marine Expeditionary Brigade from 29 Palms, California. These Marines demonstrated exceptional bravery in breaching the dangerous minefields, at times under sporadic enemy fire. Along the way, Marines took bayonets in hand and quietly probed for mines in the darkness, marking footprints as they went for their fellow Marines to follow. Well, next winter, we've got a lot of equipment from the Marine Corps that passed by here. We've got uh, a motorcycle that's been changed over for military use, a fast attack vehicle, along with one of the Marines' main battle tanks. We've got some anti-tank uh, vehicles, mortars, manning uh, control vehicles, light assault vehicles. The Marines are going to show off their stuff. This is the Marine main battle tank. It's a combat vehicle that can fire on the move. Carries 63 rounds of 105 millimeter ammunition for its main gun and 6,000 rounds of machine gun ammunition.
These fast attack vehicles are used in Southwest Asia to rapidly deploy the tow missiles, the counter enemy armor, and the fast attack vehicle is capable of negotiating the most formidable of terrain. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the high mobility, multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, the Humvee. Ladies and gentlemen, these are 155 millimeter howitzers. They provide Marine ground forces with artillery fire support. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Stanley R. Arthur, Commander of 7th Fleet during the Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. Admiral Arthur was Commander, Navy Central Command. 
Five short days after the first Iraqi troops invaded Kuwait, the carrier USS Independence steamed to the North Arabian Sea as the carrier USS Eisenhower Battle Group went through the Suez Canal into the Red Sea. And within a few short months, your Navy and Merchant Marines successfully completed the largest strategic sea lift of supplies in history. And under the baton of Senior Chief Jeffrey C. Myers, the United States Navy Band. United States Navy Band is your Navy's premier musical representative in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Rear Admiral John B. LaPlante and Naval Amphibious Forces. Within one month of the Iraqi invasion, more than 30 amphibious ships were in the Gulf of Oman, carrying 17,000 Marines and 8,000 sailors ready for combat. And in case you'd like to ask the question, what's your Navy doing for you now? The Navy continues to maintain the United Nations embargo of Iraq. We thank you very much. Rear Admiral Douglas J. Katz and Naval Strike Forces. The Strike Forces provided much of the Naval offense for operations Desert Shield and Desert Storm. These forces composed of battleships, cruisers, destroyers, frigates, and submarines provided offensive muscle during combat operations. Submarines One. registered another first two with the Navy. You know, the USS Louisville and the USS Pittsburgh fired Tommy Hawk cruise missiles against Iraq. First time, first time ever. In one two-and-a-half-day period, the USS Missouri fired more than one million pounds of ammunition. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these are the Tomahawk cruise missiles. In the very first days of the war, the Tomahawk cruise missile made its mark as a technical hero in Operation Desert Storm proved to be one of the most dramatic technical, uh, technological successes of the war. 20 ships and submarines fired nearly 290 cruise missiles into Iraq and also into occupied Kuwait during the war. The Tomahawk has the advantage of being hard to see on radar and hard to shoot down. Also is able to attack targets too dangerous for manned aircraft. Accuracy rates were outstanding. Tomahawk cruise missile. Rear Admiral Riley D. Mixon and Naval Aviation Forces. The air war de demonstrated the versatility and capability of high-tech aircraft and smart bombs. But the air war was fought and won by highly educated, motivated, and trained people. They must be all Navy people then. I understand that uh, they provided both air defense and strike capability, allowed the coalition to sever Iraqi supply lines, destroyed nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons facilities, and disabled communication networks, and eliminated Scud missile launchers. Navy does it all. <laughs> That's a pretty good record. And that was during their lunch hour, by the way. When they really got serious, they, they got serious. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Toad Pioneer Unmanned Vehicle, also known as the RPV. This is the unmanned vehicle to which Iraqi soldiers tried to surrender. 
Why? Because they knew that the USS Missouri was about to fire a big 16-inch shell their way. The reconnaissance information relayed via TV camera is brought back to the ship and they guide the aircraft to find sites for bombings. Ladies and gentlemen, these are Navy medical personnel and they're led by Captain Roger J. Penzine, Commanding Officer USS Comfort, and Captain Paul D. Berry, Commanding Officer USS Bear of uh, Mercy. More than 6,100 active duty and 9,700 reserve men and women filled a wide range of medical needs during the war. The people here today represent the best of Navy medicine. These ships provided 1,000 beds in comprehensive medical facilities that rival hospitals ashore. More than 50% of the reservists recalled were medical people. They, along with Navy corpsmen and doctors assigned to the Marine Corps, performed their duties with excellence and professionalism. Under the baton of Petty Officer Pamela Johnson, this is the Navy Band from Orlando, Florida. The only active duty military band in the state of Florida. Right behind them, ladies and gentlemen, Rear Admiral Vance H. Fry, United States Navy Supply Corps and the Navy Reserve. Nearly 20,000 Navy Reservists answered the call to duty in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, and they joined effectively with their active duty counterparts working and fighting together in harmony. This is a tribute to the constant training and high readiness of the Reserve Forces of the United States. The reserve forces provide chaplains and intelligence specialists, harbor defense units, and Navy terms they hit the deck running. Rear Admiral Robert Sutton and the Combat Logistics Force. Against Iraq, the United States won a victory half a world away, and Combat Logistics was responsible for bringing the fight to that distant enemy. These folks are still working very hard. The mission of the Logistics Support Force is far from complete. The task of bringing it all home is still underway even as we speak. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Michael R. Johnson, Civil Engineering Corps, with the Construction Battalion Forces, the Seabees of the Navy. If you like statistics, your Seabees during the service over there use more than 7.5 million board feet of lumber, 92,000 sheets of plywood, and 100,000 feet of PVC pipe. Ladies and gentlemen, perhaps at no time in modern history has the impact of air power been felt quite so strongly, so decisively as it has during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. It was air power, Air Force, Navy, Marine, Army Air, the Civil Reserve, Air Fleet, our allies as well, that made the difference in helping ring from the skies and sands of the Arabian Peninsula a victory unprecedented in its swiftness, in its totality. A victory that was and is a reaffirmation of the courage, dedication, and professionalism of America's fighting men and women. No miracle here in this victory, just good people, well prepared, well motivated, and well led with the right tools, working long hours under impossible conditions to make it happen. And naval aviation, important element of that air power, with its carriers already deployed first on scene, proving itself just as formidable, just as effective in the air as the fleet was on and beneath the surface of the Gulf. Navy Air took the fight to the enemy, flying from six big carriers in the war zone, from installations ashore. Navy fighters and attack aircraft flew nearly 21,000 combat sorties against enemy air defenses, Scud missile launchers against communications networks, 
power plants and airfields. Using precision high-tech weapons, they did the job, inflicting heavy damage on military installations vital to the enemy war effort. While the Navy's premier fighter, the F-14, joined by other Hornets, flew round-the-clock combat air patrols to protect the strike flights. And now inbound in the Navy's traditional triple diamond formation, naval fighter and attack aircraft. Lieutenant General Charles H. Horner, U.S. Central Command Air Forces. The United States Air Force Band and the Air Force Reserve Pipe Band under the direction of Lieutenant Colonel Alan J. Bonner and Drum Major Master Sergeant Jack Story. Ladies and gentlemen, Brigadier General Mike Hall and the 14th Provisional Air Division representing the Tactical Air Forces of the United States of America. Flying some 1,200 day and night missions in all weather during the conflict, E-2s were also used to guide friendly aircraft to and from their targets in search and rescue operations as well. While watching a high-speed fighter or attack aircraft land on the pitching deck of a carrier can be exciting, the plane most crewmen in the Middle East wanted to see land was the old low and slow C-2 Greyhound. Powered by two turboprop engines, the C-2 carried up to 10,000 pounds of vitally needed supplies to the carriers. On the ground, the F-15 Eagle, an all-weather, extremely maneuverable supersonic fighter designed to gain and maintain air superiority in any hostile environment. The P-3 Orion looks like a non-lethal troop transport or cargo carrier, but don't be fooled. Potential enemy sailors don't like it, and with good reason. While its primary mission is sea surveillance, this four-engine turboprop can carry torpedoes, air-to-ground missiles, and cruise missiles as well. On the ground now, Colonel Tom Blitz and the 15th Provisional Air Division of Tactical Air Force's United States Air Force. The last Navy aircraft in today's review, the C-9 Skytrain II, was as reliable as the plane it's named after, the original Skytrain, the C-47. Just as the old Goonie was based on a highly successful commercial airliner, the DC-3, the DC-9, the C-9, a derivative of the McDonnell Douglas DC-9. And like its counterpart, the C-9 carries people, supplies, and spare parts to 2,500 miles on a single tank of gas. The marine tradition of maintaining a well-trained battle-ready strike force just as strong for those who fly it is for those afloat and on land. 566 marine aircraft took part in Desert Storm. They were ready when needed. They performed as advertised. Marine pilots flew against strategic targets in Iraq. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel Lowell E. Graham and the Tactical Air Command Band. Marine Air ably represented in the Middle East by the first Marine Air attack aircraft we'll see today, the battle-tested A6E Intruder. The Vietnam vet updated with new electronics, all-weather radar, infrared video, and laser designators. The Intruder conducted deep strikes in both Iraq and Kuwait. Many missions float at night where its ability to see in the dark enabled it to stop the enemy. Go ahead. 
The next Marine aircraft, a highly modified intruder called the EA-6B Prowler. Four seats instead of the usual two. Prowler's job to fly in harm's way, to detect and jam enemy aircraft radars and missiles, destroy when necessary. The Prowler made the sky safe for the strike flights that followed them in. Efforts really appreciated. One Hornet pilot said it all, they'll never leave home without it. Lieutenant Colonel Lowell E. Graham and the Tactical Air Command Band. Base at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. Easily the most unusual strike fighter to fly in the Middle East, the av 8 b Harrier, a vector thrust jet that can take off vertically or from short fields, even highways. That ability enabled the Harrier to stay close to the troops it was supporting. In one instance, only 35 miles from the Kuwaiti border, flying some 6,000. Quick strike missions from throughout the theater, Harriers helped clear the path for the Marines. The supersonic F-A-18 Hornet, combination fighter and attack aircraft, both a superb dogfighter and gaining and maintaining air superiority, and an extremely accurate and reliable platform for dropping weapons on enemy ground targets. Seven Marine Hornet squadrons deployed to the Middle East for Desert Storm, and they amassed a total of more than 10,000 combat hours in the air, dropping more than 17 and a half million pounds of bombs. On the ground, the F-16 Fighting Falcon. A versatile performer which can attack targets day or night. A wide variety of weapons. The F-16 Fighting Falcon. The last Marine aircraft in today's aerial review, the KC-130 Hercules. Four-engine turboprop transport did more than haul cargo. Modified as an in-flight tanker to refuel Marine fighters, attack aircraft in the air, to extend their range and to give them more time over target. During Desert Storm, both active and reserve KC-130s and crews refueled more than 4,500 Allied aircraft, offloading some 26 million pounds of jet fuel in the process. The Marine KC-130 aerial tanker inbound. And on the ground, Brigadier General Edwin E. Tenoso and the 16th Air Division Provisional. Bullets and missiles weren't the only weapons used by our enemy in the Gulf, oil and other. Thousands of gallons of crew dumped into the water to help fight this ecological disaster as well as its potential impact on both the nations of the region and on the war effort. Special Coast Guard aircraft, HU-25B Guardians, quickly sent to the Mideast. Using special airborne sensor system called Red Eye, these flying labs helped us identify and track the spill's progress and to map out a battle plan for stopping it. It's the U.S. Coast Guard's HU-25B Guardian, with sophisticated side-looking radar and both infrared and ultraviolet line scanners. On the ground, the Military Airlift Command Wing, Military Airlift Command Gain Guard and Reserve Wings, the Air Rescue Service, the Air Weather Service, Defense Courier Service, and the Aerospace Audio Visual Service. It was a hot August afternoon when the Air Force Fighter Wing got the word. They were going to Saudi now. 38 hours and 7,000 miles later, two-thirds of the wings sitting alert, ready to fly combat air patrol. Five days later, five Air Force Fighter Squadrons, AWACS, and the 82nd Airborne brought in by strategic airlifters. A typical Air Force response, tough, professional, efficient. Today, you'll see some of the planes that made it possible. First, the heavily armed AC-130. And on the ground, the F-117 Stealth Fighter. Without its guns and other special equipment, the C-130 has been the Air Force's primary tactical airlifter for some 30 years now. More than 150 of them, active guard reserve, deployed at the start of Desert Shield, moving thousands of people and tons of cargo to keep coalition forces well-armed, well-fed, and well-prepared. It was the 130 that helped make possible the Hail Mary Pass. On the ground, Brigadier General Patrick J. Kaurana, the 17th Provisional Air Division. Next in line in the air, the 141 Starlifter, the backbone of America's strategic airlift fleet, the first U.S. aircraft in Saudi Arabia. It was a 141 that brought in the people and equipment needed to control the tons of cargo that would soon follow. In those tons, almost everything we needed to win the war, from Patriot missiles to mail from home. These represent the Strategic Air Command forces throughout the United States, Europe, and the Pacific. Inbound next, the largest aircraft in the free world, one that made possible history's greatest airlift, the massive C-5 Galaxy. 
During Desert Shield and Desert Storm, C-5s moved more than a quarter million tons of cargo and 87,000 troops to the Mideast. Next, the Air Force's KC-135 aerial tanker, a military version of the commercial Boeing 707. In service for more than 35 years, these flying gas stations older than most of the crews flying them. But with superb maintenance and continued upgrading and improvement, they're still on the job and will continue to be well into the next century. First Air Force F-15 fighters deployed to the Gulf, it was KC-135s that helped get them there quickly, efficiently. During Desert Shield and Desert Storm, some 256 were used. Ladies and gentlemen, representing the United States Coast Guard, Captain John R. Olson, and the United States Coast Guard Band, under the direction of Lieutenant Commander Lewis Buckley. The Air Force's newest airborne tanker, the KC-10 Extender, a triple threat aircraft that can carry people and cargo while still refueling other planes. During the war in the Middle East, KC-10's key to the rapid deployment of troops and equipment, and they extended the range and capability of all U.S. and Allied aircraft. Along with the KC-135, they pumped more than 84 million gallons of fuel. The United States Coast Guard Fort Security Unit, under the direction of uh, leadership of Commander David A. B. Edling, U.S. Coast Guard Reserve. Passing in the air next, an Air Force B-52G Stratofortress, a 30-year-old airplane that helped to fleet both the fighting strength and morale of Iraq's bonded Republican Guard. The ability of this plane to carry heavy bomb loads great distances and then drop bombs with remarkable accuracy deprived the Iraqis of their underground sanctuaries. It doesn't drop bombs, fire rockets, or launch missiles, but the air war in the Mideast wouldn't have been nearly as successful without it. The E-3 Sentry, the AWACS, Air Force's airborne warning and control system. In the air, somewhere over the Gulf, 24 hours a day, every day during the war, amassing a total of nearly 12,000 hours on patrol. Despite multiple coalition forces and languages, E-3 successfully controlled more than 3,000 allied Sudanese daily. Their radar eyes were used to spot enemy aircraft then guide friendly fighters to intercept and attack them. It was an AWACS that directed a Saudi F-15 pilot to his twin Iraqi fighter kills, the E-3A Sentry, the eyes of the American Eagle. Ladies and gentlemen, Captain Frederick N. Wilder, the United States Coast Guard Composite Unit. No single airplane contributed more to the war effort than the Air Force's F-117 stealth fighter. On that important first day of the air campaign, it represented only 2.5% of all Allied aircraft in theater, yet accounted for more than 31% of the targets hit. And while set against the most formidable air defenses ever faced by American airmen, not a single stealth was lost. The F-117, combining stealth technology with precision delivery to help ensure Allied air superiority. In the air, it's the F-117 stealth. On the ground, it's the United States Coast Guard Raider boat. Used by port security men and women during Desert Storm. Designed for port defense, anti-terrorist, and anti-sabotage operation. One key to air supremacy in the Gulf was the Air Force's F-15 Eagle. Both the air superiority version and its ground attack twin, the F-15E. Flew some 8,000 sorties, helped gain control of the skies and punish the enemy on the ground. Eagles accounted for every Air Force kill during the first 10 days of the war. Ladies and gentlemen, a great big thank you to the United States United Services Organization, the USO. The next aircraft, the F-16 Multirole Fighter. More sorties flown by these Air Force Fighting Falcons than by any other aircraft in the Mideast during the war. 13,500, maintaining more than a 95% mission-capable rate while doing it. Some F-16s equipped with special night navigation gear. Put it to good use, seeking out and destroying scud sites and key Iraqi military installations. Flying fighter tactics is hard on airplanes, no matter how well they're built. You don't expect to see many of them still in active combat at the 25-year point, but there are exceptions. Two versions of the Vietnam-era F-4 Phantom very much in evidence in the Persian Gulf. The F-4G Wild Weasel, given the tough job of finding, blinding, and destroying enemy air defenses, and the reconnaissance version, the RF-4, flying alone, unarmed, and unafraid.
Another aerial success story written by the Air Force's tank-killing A-10 Thunderbolt II. Affectionately dubbed Warthog by their pilots, these rugged, dependable, heavily armed and armored attack aircraft flew low and slow to pinpoint and destroy Iraqi tanks and armor. They proved to be equally as good as daylight scud busters, finding the launchers and destroying the missiles. The A-10! Two versions of another Vietnam-era fighter turned in outstanding performances during the Gulf War. Precision's weapons delivery and all-weather flying enabled the swing-wing F-111 to take out Saddam's key nuclear, biological, and chemical sites, as well as his hardened aircraft shelters and armor. The EF-111, called the Raven, specially equipped to blind enemy air defense radars, and it did just that. The F and EF-111. Some called it the video game war, clean, sterile, and bloodless, but it was not. Those who fought the war know better. Those who flew the swift jets in the fire over Baghdad know better. Those who slept on sand and tasted it, yet still found time to laugh know better. Those who rode the great gray ships and searched the sea and sky know better. Those who will not return know better. For them, for all that they gave, for all that was given, we raise our hand in high salute and remember, we remember. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present next the 50 state and seven territorial flags of the United States of America. These flags are displayed at many ceremonies conducted by the military, whether it be a single service parade or a joint service ceremony marking the arrival of a foreign dignitary. These flags add color to a ceremony and reflect a bit of history into every ceremony that they are presented. The seven territorial flags are the flags of the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas, and the Trust Territories of the Pacific Islands. The United States Army Military District of Washington the organization in charge of all joint service ceremonies in the nation's capital displays the flags at all joint service honor arrivals at the White House and the Pentagon, as well as presenting the state and territorial colors at major level wreath ceremonies at the Tomb of the Unknowns at Arlington National Cemetery. Ladies and gentlemen, the state and territorial flags of the United States of America. As most of you remember, there was a large call for letters to any sailor, any soldier, any airman, or any Marine in Saudi Arabia. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the armed forces of the United States would like to say, thank you, America. This is to any American, Main Street, USA. The men and women who represented our country in Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm wish to thank the American people for their kindness and strength throughout the conflict. 
carrying members of each military service, decorated with the service flags and surrounded by the 57 state and territorial flags embodying the unified participation of our nation. This float expresses the appreciation of the troops for the steadfast support they received for their efforts. To voice our pride in our nation, Ladies and gentlemen, we ask you please to join the United States Army Chorus in singing God Bless America. God bless America. gentlemen, the fireworks. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats. Please remain in your area.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until the president has left the reviewing stand. Please remain in your area until the president has left the reviewing stand. And now for those of you who remember Vietnam, uh, here is a familiar voice. Good morning, Americans. Adrian Cronauer. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your areas until the president has left the reviewing stand. Please remain where you are. Thank you. Well, folks, let me know how you feel. Did you like the parade? Yeah! I'm sorry, I had my ears closed. Did you like the parade? Yeah! That's what I thought you said. I would like to remind everybody that military units, aircraft, displays are all now on display on the mall between 14th and 7th streets. You're cordially invited to visit, see what's going on, see all the equipment used in Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Spend your time, ask questions, find out how your United States Armed Services have served you. Ladies and gentlemen, next on tap for the members of the armed services who just marched in front of you is a picnic on the ellipse for the members of the marching units and their families. I would remind all those who are family members that you do need your passes to get into the picnic and only those marching unit members and their families are allowed in the picnic area. You saw a march, now we're going to feed them. The access points for the picnic area will be open in just a few moments. They are located at Constitution Avenue and 15th Street, Constitution Avenue and 17th Street, and Constitution Avenue and 16th Street, just behind the Presidential Review Stand. Now, of course, in some parts of Constitution Avenue, the parade is still going on. The units are still marching. And so those participants in the parade will not be here at the picnic grounds for probably another hour. So family members, uh, if you're waiting to meet your troops, uh, you may do so uh, within an hour or so. It will take them time to board buses and get back to this area. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not a family member, we sure do thank you for coming out today and supporting your troops as you have throughout the conflict. 